Hello, and welcome to NHC's webinar on leveraging the tax code to increase affordable housing supply. My name is Luke Villalobos, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the National Housing Conference. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Before I hand it off to our President and CEO, David Dorkin, I have a couple of housekeeping items. There's a lot of content to get through uh, in this webinar, and so unfortunately, we'll not be having a Q&A period. However, we encourage attendees to feel free to reach out to us directly using the Q&A feature on Zoom, and uh, we will try to address your question at the end of the webinar. Um, secondly, uh, a recording of the webinar will be available to registrants, so be on the lookout for that uh, next week. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to uh, President and CEO of the National Housing Conference, David Dorkin. Thanks, Luke, and welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, National Housing Conference's 90th year, and um, we are uh, thrilled to um, have you all here and be working with so many great um, partners and stakeholders. Um, I will put in one shameless plug in the beginning that this is a great time to join NHC. If you're not already a member, you can join at nhc.org. And there's a wide range of membership opportunities, including uh, for those of you who are under 35, um, our Emerging Leaders in Affordable Housing Program uh, for just $50. Um, this is a historic year for housing opportunity um, hopefully, it will be a historic year for housing funding, and um, especially in the tax credit space, we are um, seeing a lot of hard work over many years come together, and uh, um, hopefully, um, that work will manifest itself in presidential signature on, um, among other things, the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Improvement Act. I would just note, we need to take nothing for granted. Um, and uh, this would uh, not be the first time we got this close to, um, to use a football metaphor, the end zone, um, and, um, and, and not gotten it done. So we've got to work really hard, and uh, you'll hear people talking about uh, what things are going on and, and how this bill is going to work. And, and, uh, but I think that we really should take nothing for granted and, um, and work together to... Uh, see this uh, work come to fruition. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator of our panel, Linda Mandolini. Linda is our immediate past board chair here at NHC. She's also the president and CEO of Eden Housing. Um, she's got over 10,000 uh, units of affordable housing under management. And as I always like to say, I learn a lot from Linda because um, she's one of our uh, board members who has mud on her boots. And she will periodically remind me that yes, indeed, there is mud on her boots and they're in her trunk. So without any further ado, I'll give you Linda Madalini. Great, thank you, David, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's a super exciting panel and a very exciting time to be talking about tax credits and housing. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, it is one of the oldest and most successful housing production programs. It's been in place since 1986, which was the Reagan administration and has enjoyed a very long history of bipartisan support. Um, we're at a really critical juncture, as David mentioned, Congress is talking about infrastructure. And in my worldview, housing is probably one of the most important pieces of infrastructure for the communities that we serve. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce the panelists and we're gonna to get to some of our questions. And I would encourage you, if you have questions, to put them up in the Q&A. Um, our first panelist today is Emily Kotick. Uh, Emily is the executive director of the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition and the co-sponsor of this webinar with us today. Uh, AHTCC, which is their acronym, is a trade organization that focuses specifically on advocacy for the housing credit and for building more affordable housing using the credit. Peter Lawrence is the Director of Public Policy and Government Relations for Novogratic Consulting. Novogratic, for those of you who don't know them, which would be hard for me to believe, uh, given that this webinar is probably attracting a lot of people who know about the tax credit. Um, they're an accounting and consultancy uh, that really specializes in tax credits, not just affordable housing tax credits, but other important credits for community development, renewable energy, and historic preservation. Buzz Roberts. Uh, the CEO of the National Association of Affordable Housing Lenders, a national coalition of, pro of uh, 
profit or for profit and mission motivated lenders that provide capital for affordable housing and community development. Uh, Buzz's acronym, acronym, as you'll see on the screen, is NAHL, uh, N A A H L. And last but certainly not least, Steve Pontel, the CEO of uh, my sister organization in Southern California, National Community Re Renaissance. Uh, uh, National Core, as they're known, works uh, in four states. Uh, they own uh, 80 properties by um, last count, uh, and they're very active in the in the tax credit in both affordable housing production and preservation. Um, we have a really great panel of experts, and they all know, uh, I think, a lot about what's going on and a lot about the specifics of not just the affordable housing tax credit, but all of the credits. And so with that, I'm going to put my first question out to to Emily. Emily, this is really a historic juncture. We have never seen packages, both for the budget and for the uh, infrastructure package, so large, a uh, huge opportunity for housing. Can you talk to us a little bit about what the meaning of this is and what the lay of the land is for the, the low income housing tax credit in this current um, atmosphere that we're in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Linda, and thank you, David and Luke and the NHC team for getting us together. I think when uh, the date for this webinar was picked, it was, um, we probably didn't even know just how critical of a juncture you'll keep hearing today uh, that this week is, but is very well timed. It's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a really interesting and hopefully probably the most impactful next few weeks, couple of months, however long it takes. Um, if this whole infrastructure thing works out, uh, we could see some of the biggest expansions of housing programs, uh, maybe ever. So uh, we'll get into uh, certainly you know, what this means for housing credit, some of the other tax credit proposals impacting housing as we go, but um, did wanna kind of start by just talking about where we are in this process, especially because uh, you know, the whole part they leave out when we all learn about how a bill becomes a law is the whole, you know, what happens when you're on a two track uh, you know, process where there's a bipartisan bill, there's a reconciliation bill, what does that mean? And uh, understandably, there's a lot of questions, even for those of us who've uh, been, been working on this for a while. So where we are right now, and this is uh, literally changing by the minute at this point, but we'll see if we can make it through the next hour without any breaking news on infrastructure, is uh, we are in the second part of the two-track infrastructure process. So the first part was the bipartisan infrastructure framework, about $550 billion uh, covered what we think of as traditional hard infrastructure, roads and bridges, uh, and that's already passed the Senate, and the House is just waiting to take that up. They don't want to take it up yet until they have assurance that they have this second piece, the, uh, the budget reconciliation package. It's not going to be bipartisan. It's going to be Democrats only voting for it at the end of the day, and it's going to include what they're calling human infrastructure. So that's where you include uh, housing priorities, um, lots of other uh, basically democratic priorities that aren't roads and bridges, but can still uh, fit into the kind of broader infrastructure bucket. So the, uh, the initial budget resolution has passed uh, $3.5 trillion is what they can spend up to that amount. It's not necessarily going to be the full amount. And I'm sure you've all seen some of the reports from uh, especially some of the moderate senators like Senator Manchin and Cinema, saying they might not be comfortable with $3.5 trillion. So think about that as an upper limit that can be distributed to all of the committees and from within the committees, they figure out how much goes to each individual program. So uh, we're focusing on tax today. There's also quite a bit of money that's uh, gonna be allocated to the uh, Banking and Financial Services Committee for housing. Uh, that's gonna be kind of a separate bucket but what we're waiting to see is how much uh, money we're basically working with for the tax committees. So the Senate Finance Committee, House Ways and Means Committee are going to figure out how much money they can raise from various pay-fors, tax increases, um, whatever they come up with to try to offset the cost of the bill. And from there, they'll figure out how much money can go into the broader community development bucket. And then from there, they'll go to um, you know, how much can go to the low income housing tax credit. And then from there, you know, what exactly are we doing on the housing credit? What are we doing on neighborhood homes? So there's a lot of moving pieces that are moving right now. Um, they are figuring out right in advance of a uh, markup that's beginning in the House Ways and Means Committee as slated for next Thursday. So a week from now, um, where we might you know, start seeing them mark up the tax increases, the these different housing provisions, the housing credit, neighborhood homes, um, 
you know, new markets tax credit, historic tax credits, all of the other pieces that kind of fall into this bucket for the House Ways and Means Committee. And we are uh, kind of very eagerly <laughs> waiting to see what, uh, what some of these numbers look like. We don't know that yet, but we've been pushing really hard and we've got a lot of allies pushing for us. And we also have uh, chairs of the tax committees with uh, Senator Wyden and, and Richie Neal over on the House side who are huge supporters of affordable housing and the housing credit specifically. So we know that they're fighting for us and they're gonna try to get um, the most that they can, but we are pushing as hard as we can to try to um, not let, let this opportunity pass us by when um, we are going to see, you know, it's not just trying to get one little provision here or there on a year-end tax bill. This is talking about a major expansion of programs, creation of new programs, and we don't know when we'll have this opportunity again. So really trying to take advantage of this moment. And Emily, if I could just ask a follow-up, because a lot of us, uh, and I imagine some in the audience, have been working on the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act uh, together, and that, that's got some key components, and this is the time to get some of those key components into, into this big reconcilia reconciliation there, package. Can you talk about what some of the big components are and, and that we're really trying to push for in this package specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, which is the comprehensive legislation to expand and strengthen the housing credit that we have been working on since 2016. And it's what served as sort of the menu of options from which Congress pulls out pieces that have made it across the finish line. So when we got uh, the first expansion of the program in a decade in 2018, when we got income averaging before the uh, IRS made some changes that um, rendered it a bit useless for the time being, when we got the 4% rate done, that all came out of the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. And now we're seeking again to include as much of that act as we can. Now there's a couple factors here with reconciliation and we won't go through uh, all the details, but the basic things to know about this budget reconciliation process are uh, there has to be a score for all provisions. There has to be a budgetary impact. Um, so if it's just something like changing the name of the low income housing tax credit to the affordable housing tax credit, that's not eligible. That violates what's called the bird rule. The other issue is you're not supposed to increase deficits outside of a 10 year window. So that means that when you're talking about a credit that flows for 10 years, anything we implement is going to have a cost outside of the 10 year window and we have to do as much as we can to keep that low. So in a lot of cases, we're gonna to have to make changes to provisions such as making them temporary or phasing them in differently or you know, otherwise kind of making some changes so they can be reconciliation friendly. But that means that because you have to have a budgetary impact, the two biggest unit producers in the AHCIA are very much eligible to be included here. So the two biggest pieces, which uh, account for most of the uh, 2 million units that this bill could create if it were enacted in full, thank you to the Novogratic team for that analysis, um, is a 50% increase of the housing credit uh, phased in over two years, and lowering the 50% threshold of bond financing that you need in order to access the full amount of 4% credits, lowering that 50% test down to 25%. And while it's a lot of um, use of the word percent and it all sounds um, you know, very, uh, they're not the most elegant provisions to explain, those, those two provisions alone could finance over 1.5 million affordable homes. And we've heard from the Biden administration that they wanna create 2 million affordable homes as part of the Build Back Better agenda. And here we have this um, very bipartisan, well-vetted way to get there that builds on 30 plus years of success. So we are pushing um, first and foremost, those two provisions because of the biggest impact. Um, we would love to see what else from the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. We have room to get in as well. There's a number of uh, basis boost provisions that uh, help the credit do more to serve uh, extremely low income tenants, rural areas, Native Americans. So if we can include those as well. And then for those of you who know the bill well, there's about um, 20 other provisions and a lot of those are gonna fall out because they don't meet that test of having a revenue impact. But if there are ones that, you know, the kind of the Joint Committee on Taxation and the others who govern uh, this process think do have a score, we're gonna try to include everything we can and they should be pretty low cost. So we are going through the process now of finding out, you know, what does everything cost? Um, does it cost enough? Does it cost too much? How can we lower the cost? And we should know within the next um, few days or couple of weeks what the starting position from the house will be. 
Super exciting. Um, so Buzz, I'm gonna go to you next. Uh, we have the Bipartisan Neighborhood Homes Investment Act also potentially moving forward in some form or fashion. Can you talk about what this act does and what you think might get into this set of reconciliated packages? Yes, thank you, Linda, and uh, hello, everyone. And also thank you to uh, David and Luke and the National Housing Conference team. Uh, Neighborhood Homes Investment Act is a proposal for a new tax credit that would build or and rehab half a million homes for owner occupancy in distressed communities over the next 10 years. Um, it uh, has uh, lead support in the House uh, from two members of the Ways and Means Committee, Brian Higgins, a Democrat from New York, and Mike Kelly, a Republican from Pennsylvania. And in the Senate, uh, from two members of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Senator Ben Cardin, a Democrat from Maryland, and Senator Rob Portman, a Republican from Ohio. It's also included in the Biden-Harris uh, Build Back Better plan, or the Jobs Plan, or their housing plan, all those. Um, so it does have uh, 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 some uh, support in key places. It's also included in Senator Wyden's DASH Act, which uh, 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 Emily has uh, discussed a little bit. Uh, many people think of affordable housing as rental housing, but in fact, home ownership can be affordable housing too. And uh, in two thirds of all the counties in the US, home ownership is actually less expensive, more affordable than uh, rental housing. So um, uh, neighborhood homes uh, gets at some of uh, that balance in expanding the affordable housing stock. Uh, it's also uh, aimed very much at stabilizing and revitalizing distressed uh, communities, urban, rural, and suburban. As uh, many folks are undoubtedly aware, in many distressed uh, neighborhoods in rural areas, uh, single family homes are the dominant land use. It's very hard to revitalize those neighborhoods or to retain or attract residents um, in these neighborhoods because homes tend to be in poor condition. Uh, but the dilemma is that it's not financially feasible to rehab or build new homes because home values are too low to cover the development cost. It should, that should ring uh, a familiar chord because of course that's the principal challenge that the low-income housing credit addresses on the affordable rental housing side. Uh, neighborhood homes uh, addresses the problem by filling the development finance gap. And like the low-income housing credit, it would be a capped credit administered by the states. The states would write qualified allocation plans subject to public comment. Um, and then applicants would compete for allocations, raise private investment capital, develop the homes in eligible neighborhoods, and sell them to home buyers with incomes up to 140% of the area median income. So in a typical metro area with a median income of about 70 or $75,000, you're looking at a maximum uh, income level of about $100,000. So this is clearly geared at um, low, moderate, and middle income homeowners in these communities. And then when the homes are completed and sold, uh, the credits are activated immediately and there's no ongoing compliance. Uh, once the developers and investors are out of the picture, they've done their job, they have no further control over the, over the homes. Uh, so there, that makes uh, neighborhood homes a little simpler in terms of, because there's no long-term compliance, there's no re recapture that we see uh, appropriately in the low-income housing credit. So the credit, as I say, covers the gap between the cost of development and the sale price. There are some limits on that. The, the credit can't exceed 35% of development costs and it can't, uh, it, for any given home, and it can't exceed um, 
uh, a, a national formula amount. Uh, it's about $100,000 for home today. We also have some provisions for uh, owner-occupied rehabs that are uh, uh, have a few different wrinkles in them. The eligible census tracts uh, would have low or moderate income and elevated poverty and low home values. Uh, that low home value requirement means that a lot of gentrifying areas would not be eligible for this uh, credit, that there the development finance gaps are not great and uh, there's a concern of not uh, accelerating gentrification and perhaps involuntary displacement as a result. Um, in addition to that, uh, we, there is a 20% what we call wild card, which would provide more flexibility, particularly for non-metropolitan census tracts uh, that might not meet the, all the income and poverty criteria. And that's important to advancing economic development in those communities uh, where we often hear that uh, employers are uh, uh, reluctant to expand or locate because there are no homes for uh, workers to live there. So um, we think this has a, a very strong fighting chance uh, to get into the reconciliation bill and could be sort of a third leg in, in the community development tax credit world along with uh, low-income housing and new markets. And I'll stop there and turn it back to Linda. Great, thanks, Buzz. That's really an exciting credit for a lot of communities uh, throughout the country. Um, we have this other credit that we're also interested in, and I'm going to turn to Steve and Peter to talk about the middle income tax credit, because this is new. Uh, MyTech, I believe, is its acronym. Uh, so Steve, I'm going to start with you. Can you can you talk to MyTech? And then I'm going to turn to Peter to talk technical on MyTech. Steve, you need to unmute yourself to speak. <laughs> it's only been a year and a half, isn't that what we say? So thank you, Linda, uh, and thank you, NHC, for hosting this. You know, what, one of the things that I think my tech opens the door of the conversation is one that we should be having about thinking about housing in a continuum. And because we, we need to care about all levels of housing, and we need to think about the the how people progress from one uh, cost of housing to another. And, and one of the biggest challenges I think we have today is what we call the gap, the gap between LIHTC and market rate. And how do we get, you know, how do we bridge the gap? You know, how do we mine the gap? And my tech is, is, a, is a, a thought moving in that direction. Uh, it's definitely going to have certain states that where the cost of producing housing uh, exceeds the ability of uh, area median income residents to be able to afford market rate housing. So it provides another stepping stone towards market rate housing as a solution. One of the things I often talk to uh, my team about is, you know, it's great for the 100, 150 families that win the lottery and, you know, are able to move into one of our developments, but the thousands that are on the wait list, we should be even more concerned about. And so we spend a lot of time trying to work with our families on what their options are to be able to move out to free up the units that we have for families that are waiting. And my tech can be one of those solutions. I think we need to give Senator White a lot of credit for thinking strategically about progression and the, the, you know, the entire range of housing. And so I think what my tech brings to the table is an important card that can play, that can be played where it's appropriate for those communities that have those struggle. Uh, you know, the, you know, Peter can go into the details, but one of the benefits of the MyTech program is any unused MyTech rolls into a LIHTC opportunity. And so, you know, it's not an either or, and it's really up to the state and the uh, implementers within that state to identify, you know, how this tool can be best played. Um, expanding housing of all types is something that we should be strongly advocating for. Peter, why don't you kind of walk through some of the specific technical aspects of my tech. Sure. Thanks, Steve. And, and uh, let me add my thank you to the uh, National Housing Conference team for inviting me to talk today. Uh, I'm very excited, uh, like my fellow panelists, on the, the prospects that we have uh, in, in Congress to substantially increase 
uh, in affordable housing resources. And I just want to emphasize one of those points that Steve made. This really, you should, uh, I think, make sure you realize my tech is a, is a key part of the continuum that uh, you know, Senator Wyden had as part of his DASH Act. You could, you know, he, his le comprehensive legislation addresses needs starting from the homeless with uh, vouchers all the way to going to a single uh, first time, um, you know, home ownership tax credit. Uh, and this was a key part of the continuum uh, for that because I think as many folks uh, on this webinar are, are, are well aware, uh, you know, the, at uh, the income levels just above the traditional uh, housing credit income limits, it's often very hard to find affordable one housing, especially in certain markets. Uh, uh, there is really, uh, you know, there's plenty of uh, rental housing on the luxury end of the market that's being built. That's what's where the economics are driving a lot of the development. And then, you know, the, the housing credit has been successful for its, you know, demographic, but just above that, there really is a so-called missing middle. Uh, and what, uh, you know, uh, Chairman Wyden's MyTech proposal would do is essentially create similar credits that, the, that you have on a housing credit. It's very similar, borrows very extensively from the, the, state, the, the um, housing credit statute. The only sort of the difference is instead of a 9% and a 4% uh, uh, housing credit, you would have a 5% MyTech that's allocated on a per capita basis with a small state minimum. That's a, a dollar uh, per capita, 1.4 uh, million small state minimum. Uh, uh, that that's, uh, each state would uh, allocate as per a qualified allocation plan. And then there would be a 2% MyTech that states could choose to accompany a, a 4% uh, private activity bond finance property. Uh, and uh, the, you would have to reserve at least 60% of the units for property uh, for uh, families earning between 60 and 100% of the area mean income. You would have to have a market study to demonstrate the need for that particular demographic uh, uh, to, to do that. And you could have it mixed in with the housing credit as long as you meet the requirements under both and you couldn't get uh, the same assistance on the same unit. So you, for instance, you could have a property that was, had uh, 40 in hundred unit property, you could get a 40 units that had a 9% credit so attached to it and 60 uh, units with the 5% uh, MyTech added to that. Uh, and while uh, it's not yet uh, online, I can tell you that later this afternoon, uh, we'll have posted our analysis of how many units that we expect these credits to create. And it's, it'll be more than 344,000 units over a decade uh, could be financed. And that there is a little bit of variability on the 2% MyTech. We don't know how many states would choose uh, to allocate to that side. Uh, so that number that I gave you, that 344,000, that assumes about 15% of the private activity bond cap uh, that would be allocated with uh, for my tech assistance, and that would also, by the way, bring you know four percent credit uh, units along with it because that's one of the requirements that uh, Chairman My Tech ha uh, Chairman Wyden had for his My Tech proposal. And I guess I would just add, you know, I think there's been increasing research. You know, at Harvard's uh, Joint Center on uh, Housing Studies is sort of demonstrating that the the unfortunate cost burns, which are admittedly much greater on the lower income side, and certainly from our perspective. The housing credit is the big priority. Uh, so if we had to choose between LIHTC and MITEC, I think uh, universally would go with, with the housing credit first. Uh, but uh, there is a, a growing need uh, for that area, for the, the, the housing just above that uh, demographic. Uh, and uh, you know, I think the key difference that you know, some have suggested by if we just changed zoning, uh, we could uh, uh, you know, produce housing that would be affordable to to the, these, these middle income households. And I think that that's really, I don't think presents an accurate pi a picture because uh, there, there's nothing, zoning might help reduce the cost, but it doesn't lock up the housing for 30 years for this demographic. And what we've seen in recent years is that uh, there's a diminution of affordability for this and it's growing uh, because uh, market rate housing is getting refurbished and uh, rents are charging that are not affordable. Uh, to middle income households. So I think that's the key, you know, uh, rationale that uh, why Chairman Wyden is producing that because it, it's producing a stable housing stock 
uh, for uh, um, a uh, demographic that doesn't have a you know uh, a rental housing program that's really targeted to them. So that's why we think it's it's a valuable addition to the, the uh, housing toolkit. Yeah. So Peter, while we're talking about Senator Wyden, I'm gonna just ask you a little bit about the Dash Act um, since this is a also a kind of tandem sort of package that has some of the same provisions as the AHCIA. Can you describe you know, generally what's in the DASH Act and, and how it relates to the AH, AHCIA and like why it exists if we already have one package with a bunch of stuff in it? To be technical in my question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a great question. And you know, I think it's worth just reminding folks that that uh, uh, you know, Chairman Wyden was a second lead de Democratic co-sponsor on the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. And I think you know, the way I would present it is the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act has been the industry consensus of you know, bipartisan legislation that uh, has been worked as, uh, introduced, Emily mentioned it before, so over several con Congresses. It has a lot of uh, 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 comprehensive uh, proposals that the industry has sort of come up and helped develop over time uh, to, to make a, you know, an already effective program work even better uh, uh, to update it for uh, you know, what's the situation for today. Uh, and I think what the DASH Act kind of represents in my mind is this is uh, Chairman Wyden's particular priorities within it, uh, for, especially for the housing credit. He's plucking from it and saying, for this upcoming reconciliation bill, these are the, the proposals in particular that I want to advance. And these are sort of my opening bid. Uh, uh, you know, we've always viewed, and as sort of Emily mentioned over the years, that Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act has been the menu from which Congress has, uh, you know, picked uh, uh, to address uh, uh, needs. And uh, you know, Wyden is going taking that step further and saying, of this menu, here are my particular priorities. I want to advance in the upcoming reconciliation bill. And I invite others to, to also uh, provide their, their thoughts on that. Yeah, I think Emily? that um, Peter covered it well, but the only thing I'd add is just, uh, you know, I mentioned that, you know, we're not gonna be able to include all of the AHCIA, but the fact that about half of the AHCIA is in the DASH Act says that the chairman takes it really seriously. And it really just uh, helps us better position all of those uh, priorities for inclusion. It sends a signal to other senators. It sends a signal to the House that this is important to the senator. So uh, even though, you know, it's um, a little confusing having the multiple bills out there, it just, you know, at, at these times, we try to have as much support as possible from as many members showing not only did we sign on to this bill the first time, but we are supporting this, you know, specifically right now in reconciliation. This is a very good way to do that. And I forgot to mention one quick thing, Linda, if you don't mind. You know, one, one big difference in DASH as compared to the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act on one of the key provisions that lowering the bond financing threshold is that he only has it uh, available for four uh, bond issuance years as opposed to being permanent uh, uh, in the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. And that uh, I actually, uh, in, in the uh, chat, I uh, included links to our just fresh off the press uh, 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 you, you know, estimate on the units that the DASH Act uh, uh, would uh, finance. And as a result, because that one really big piece is temporary, you know, we're only estimating 1.1 million units, which is still a huge amount. Uh, for the for the the Dash Act's housing credit provisions, as opposed to the two million that the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act uh, would finance. So this is a lot. This is a lot of new homes, right? So, and I see there's a couple of questions in the chat that I also have on my list. But before I get there, you know, there's this. There's a couple of big provisions in the low income housing tax credit. You know, I work here with Eden in California. We are super uh, interested in the expansion of tax exempt bonds by lowering the fifty percent test. So. Um, I'm going to ask Emily first just to explain what that provision kind of means for people out there who don't maybe speak tax credit in as fluently as some of us on the webinar do. Yeah, sure. And um, this is also one of the newer pieces of the HCIA. So, you know, some of these pieces have been kicking around since 2016. But uh, while we've been hearing from our friends in California and New York and Washington and Massachusetts about the need for more bond resources for housing for a while, uh, this is something that really grew pretty quickly uh, and has spread to a lot of other states just in terms of 
uh, maxing out bond cap, you know, the 4% credit used to be more of an un unlimited resource, and now it is very much limited. And we're starting to see, uh, in some cases, the 4% side of the program as oversubscribed as the 9% side is. And especially since we got the 4% rate set at the end of last year and the program is working as it should, um, it's just been exacerbated. So the idea is um, the 50% financing threshold of private activity bonds that you need in order to get the full amount of 4% credits has always been arbitrary. It would, used to be 70% back in the day, Congress lowered it to 50%. And we're saying, why don't you lower it to 25% so that all you would have to do is meet uh, the 25% target uh, and you can use all of that other bond cap that you now no longer need to put into the project for more affordable housing units or whatever else the state wants to do with it. It just essentially frees up more bond cap. You can do uh, twice the deals on the 4% side with the same amount of bonds is really the gist of it. And that's certainly the case in the states where bond cap is fully utilized. But it's even helpful in the states where it's not because um, as we discussed that 50% threshold is neither wanted nor needed. So this is a good way to uh, bring that down to a more reasonable level and uh, create an efficiency in the program. And then, you know, in some states allow for a lot more production. So I'm gonna uh, pivot to Steve and just ask the question from a multi-state developer perspective. You know, there's this menu of really great stuff out there. Um, what are you thinking about which one you need for Florida versus what you need for California? Um, and, and do you have any thoughts on, you know, how you're advocating in different geographies for different uh, aspects of these packages? Yeah, it is interesting how the different states establish their processes and their priorities. And so navigating each state individually is something that takes a certain amount of, of effort and energy in addition to the economics of the state. So in Arkansas, for example, when it is often the case that the market rate housing is less expensive than the affordable housing. And then what we're dealing with is, you know, the quality of the housing, um, you know, it's a different conversation, a different priority as we're moving forward. Uh, the, the question in the chat about the MyTech potentially competing with the LightTech is if there, is there enough, it does fall back to, do, it depends on the state. And you know, within California, uh, there would be enough demand for all product that would be available. So I don't think there would be any, you know, LIHTC deals that would be lost because there was all of a sudden a MyTech opportunity. And Texas and Florida are somewhat similar, although the gap is less, uh, especially in Texas between the market rate housing and the low income housing tax credit uh, housing. And so it, it goes back to understanding how the, continuum works within a state where the market rate housing that's being produced or the, the current stock of market rate housing fits in and what incomes can afford that housing. And then how do we build a platform for those families that can't quite reach that and make it a ladder you know, as opposed to a cliff. And so I, I'm not specifically answering your question on the technical differences, but I can tell you that different cities, for example, within Texas, you know, Austin is a great example right now where the mark, where the cost of market rate housing is significant. You know, the, the, the missing middle, as Peter referred to it uh, earlier, is getting larger and larger. And so a product like MyTech could be very beneficial in that kind of a market. So it really depends on the market and it really depends on the cost of production within those markets and what those incomes are. And then it's a matter of the state and the local communities building a, a process that can meet the needs of the community so that everybody has opportunity for access to housing. I think the, the message is big toolbox is better because kind of like the tax credit has always been a toolbox that a state could take and tailor to its individual needs, which is why it's been so popular and so effective is, you know, can my tech work in a lot of different jurisdictions? So Peter, I actually wanna go back to you on the question of what is middle. In California, we are defining missing middle as up to 120% of AMI, which is why I think, Buzz, your program is useful. But I do wonder, um, for the Neighborhood Homes Act, do we have census tracts in places like California that qualify? Yes. Uh, there's a map of, of the qualifying tracts. Uh, it's available at neighborhoodhomesinvestmentact.org. And you can see the tracts, for, again, for non-metro areas, uh, they're up to 20% of the credits could be used in non-metro areas that aren't gonna show up on that map, but uh, have incomes below the state's median. 
great. And then, you know, Peter, back to the definition of missing middle, is there any chance to have a kind of high cost boost in that definition that's a little, a little broader than 100% of AMI? You know, uh, Chairman Wyden, when he was uh, drafting the MyTech proposal, did get some input from folks uh, to suggest, you know, expanding it from uh, 60 to 100 versus 60 to 120 percent EMI because there are certain markets that are available. And he, in the end, he decided not to go that high. Uh, but because I, I think you know, in, in his mind, the first important step is to get the, the credit created first. Uh, and it, once it's got a proven track record, it might be easier to, to take that step. Because uh, I, I do think as you go through the states, uh, the higher AMIs you get, the less likely uh, you, you, the, there's a, a, a deficit of rental housing for that. Certainly places in California, absolutely. There are definitely 120 AMIs, maybe there may be a deficit there, uh, but it's less likely in other states. And I think he, drew, he chose to keep it at uh, a median uh, so that it, it would have more replicability across a greater number of states. Okay, great. You so know, Linda, have... Linda, just, just one of the things to look at is, um, you know, uh, when it comes to the welfare exemption or the property tax exemption, uh, you know, we, as long as we're producing 80% median income and less, we can get it. Their housing authorities can go up to 120%. And so if you're thinking about the creation and still get the welfare exemption. So if you're thinking about the creation of mixed income neighborhoods and communities and avoiding the over concentration of poverty, you would want to be able to have a range of incomes that could be within the community. And there are some housing authorities that are using that ability to build those kinds of mixed income communities. Great point. I, I had a chance to uh, check. Um, and in California, 8 million people live in qualified census tracts for the neighborhood homes credit. So that's eight of our 39 million. That's a good number for us, Buzz. Thank you for clarifying <laughs> that. Um, sorry to be so. California centric with that that particular question, um, but high cost states do have different considerations, and so I think really uh, having clarity on that is helpful to all of us. Um, I, I do want to ask a little bit about how are you going to get to consensus on priorities for reconciliation? And so Emily, I've been at several of your calls as a member where we're talking about what's going to rise to the top. I mean, we got to if it's rising to the top, it's doing that in the next three days. So can you talk a little bit about you know? What, what's at the at the very top of the very short list uh, that we really got to get over the finish line and, and how do we prioritize? Yeah, it's a very good question. And uh, for us, the driving factor has been production, the number of homes we can produce. And uh, we've got the two provisions, the uh, allocation increase and lowering the 50% test. And we know that that can get us uh, most of the way to the 2 million homes that the administration wants to produce. And that if we uh, add in those other basis boosts, we get all the way there. So that made it pretty easy to let Congress know, you know, we would like to see as much of these provisions for as long as we can. Uh, but I'll also just give the industry credit for uh, really, I think, understanding that if we're all asking for different things, none of us get anything. And we really uh, saw this when it took three years to get the minimum 4% rate set. And there are lots of things that uh, lots of groups would have liked to see get across the finish line. But we all knew when we were um, having to use so much political capital to get even just you know the 4% rate done that if if there were four asks from the LIHTC industry, it would have been very easy to say, you know, we don't even understand what the, the most pressing issue is here and uh, there's no room on this bill. So the focus, we, I, I think we've all seen what the focus leads to and, and we know we have to be on the same page. And uh, so, you know, I think everyone's been, at this point, we haven't, you know, been put in a place where we have to say anything less than we want these, these two main provisions at the very least. I hope we don't get there, um, but it's, it's been pretty clear at least through this point. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I also want to talk about, you know, um, I have all of my fingers crossed that we get these things across the, the starting line uh, so that we can build more housing. Um, what, what happens to investor appetite, you know, um, if we get it all? Uh, you know, what are we thinking about how the credits would, would hit the market and what would happen on the other side? Uh, I don't know, Emily, Peter, you want to talk about that? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start off and I'm sure Peter's thoughts as well. Um, it's definitely a question we get a lot with good reason. Uh, it's definitely a, a good problem to have if we end up in the position where we're worried about getting uh, you know, too much growth in the program at once when just a few years ago, we were all fighting to keep private activity bonds from being eliminated in tax reform. So it's really uh, quite a 180 here. Um, so there's a few factors that you know we can't answer. Um, you know, if this happens, here's what you know pricing will be. But one thing to think about is, you know, they're going to have to offset a lot of this bill. And uh, still on the table is, are they going to increase the corporate tax rate? We don't know that. We'll know a lot more about that soon. But that's certainly one factor that could influence uh, demand. Um, there's also CRA reform still uh, looming out there. We are very glad that the OCC's proposal on CRA reform has been uh, put to rest. Um, but even uh, you know very small changes to CRA could have a big impact on affordable housing uh, production, as I'm sure uh, Buzz can tell you much better than I can. And so that's you know something that's still out there as well as a, a regulatory uh, kind of dial that that may be helpful to us in the future. Um, there's also this new announcement uh, just this week that uh, FHFA lifted the caps on Fannie and Freddie investing in the housing credit. So while they were capped at 500 million a piece, now that's going up to 850 million. So we've got uh, some some major new investment coming into the market. So I think it'll be you know a little while before we know how all of these factors interact with one another, but um, certainly something to look out for. And I'll also just note that you know we are. We, we did propose not to get a 50% increase in the credit overnight, but to phase it in over two years. And we've been talking to the committees about other uh, changes we could make so that, you know, we, to make sure anything that we do get remains at a level we're confident the market could absorb. Peter, you wanna add I, anything to that? Yeah, I think uh, Emily caught it uh, very well. I just, the one thing I just add in addition to her, uh, comment about what FHFA took to, to raise the GSE investment caps, you know, that, that they really, when they were originally set, uh, that, that $500 million cap represented just under 7% of the 2017 uh, um, uh, housing credit uh, equity market. Uh, now, given all the various changes Congress already is enacted with the disaster credits, the 4% for you know, we're projecting probably somewhere around a $22.5 billion uh, equity market for 2021. And so that increased cap represents 7.5 for, you know, a tiny bit greater percentage, but nothing like the percentages that Fannie and Freddie had uh, before the 2008 recession when they were routinely annually 35 to 40% of the annual market. So I think those folks were worried about that level of dominance, I think that that's not coming into play uh, there. And that FHFA did say uh, that they plan to revisit that. Uh, so if you know Congress were to uh, enact a, a large increase to uh, uh, housing credit allocations in the reconciliation bill, I can imagine they could act to once again sort of uh, maintain a similar market share and help buoy the market. Uh, uh, you know that 500 million. They established in 2017, I think it's worth remembering, was established right after, right, yeah, actually, about the same time tax reform uh, was happening, which lessened uh, the equity market and helped buoy it there. So uh, I think uh, that is that is certainly one lever the administration can, can take to, to help address uh, investor demand. Great, thank you for that. So I'm going to ask one last uh, small technical question and then uh, ask the big question that is in, has been in the chat since the beginning. Um, so my last question is, you know, there's little things that we might like to get done with the tax credit. And Emily, you sort of alluded to the process earlier. Um, income averaging uh, and fixing the 80% income averaging challenge is uh, one of the ones on my list for Eden. But uh, I'm curious, um, is there an opportunity to sneak some little stuff in here that we've been trying to clean up for a couple of years that we just can't seem to get the IRS to deal with? Yeah, so there is potentially uh, an opportunity and, and we'll have to see. Um, you may have noticed in the DASH Act, there were a couple of the deadline extensions on housing credit, uh, kind of the COVID uh, extensions for certain things that were in there. So, you know, there's going to be an attempt to try to do some of these things, um, but a lot of them could fall out because of the, uh, the reconciliation process and the bird rule. So 
We do have a lot of um, members of Congress trying to use their leverage to urge the IRS to do some of these things uh, without having to go the legislative route. Obviously, anytime you get something signed into law, a lot of political capital has gone into it. And sometimes it's uh, more expedient to just have members weigh in with um, their friends at the IRS and say, this is a huge problem. And um, Linda, I know some of the, the members of Congress you've been reaching out to have done that after hearing about, you know, what an impact the changes to income averaging have had. So, you know, I, at this point, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on income averaging being one of the things that gets addressed in reconciliation. There's the potential for some other small things, though. Great. So I'm going to ask the, the question that got put up in the chat really early and, and just uh, ask it uh, of all of you. Um, what can we do to help get this stuff over the finish line? Uh, we are very close. I, I don't even think finish line is the right word. It's uh, David had the right analogy. We're in the red zone and we've got like one yard to go. H how do we get this stuff done? Well, I can start us off. So first, I want to thank everyone for getting us to where we are, um, where we have so much support we've been able to call upon that we've cultivated over years of phone calls and emails and property visits. Uh, so for example, when three weeks ago, we emailed all of you and said, we're doing a sign on letter in the House, we need all the Democrats we can to uh, reach out to leadership and say they want to see these housing credit proposals and reconciliation. And we got more than half of the House Democrats signed on in two weeks. Uh, we weren't you know, going out and changing hearts and minds for the first time. We were uh, really reaching out to people whose support we'd already earned and just saying, you know, now is the time we really need you. So a lot of the work has been done. That said, there, there is going to be a moment sometime in the next uh, few weeks here or however long this process ends up taking uh, where we reach out to all of you and say, you know, we really need you to reach out to this member and here's exactly what we need. And we just hope that uh, you all have taken away uh, how big the opportunity is, but also how uh, quickly things are moving and, and how seriously to take this current effort. So, um, you know, if you haven't lately checked in with your uh, Democratic members of Congress, and of course, while we We've always had bipartisan support for this program. Um, at the moment, Republicans are not helping to shape the reconciliation bill, so we can leave them alone for now. But uh, any Democratic members of Congress you have a relationship with, if you haven't checked in, say, you know, we understand it's crunch time. Um, we would like to see the housing credit expanded and strengthened uh, in reconciliation. Here's our, you know, top priorities, or, or don't even get into that level. They'll know, they'll know what it means. Uh, reach out to any of us if you need help with it. But um, Certainly, I, I wouldn't worry at this point about um, reaching out too much because they're hearing from a lot of groups and we need to make sure they're, they're hearing from us on the credit as well. So do we call, do we email, do we do all of the above? Do, you know, if you know them personally, do you pick up the phone and say, hey, you really got to pay attention to this? Like, uh, that's literally the question beyond making phone calls, what else should we do, could we do? Um, yeah, so um, if you have a relationship with someone, certainly reach out to the person you have a relationship with and you know, thank them for being there for us and let them know we're really counting on them. Um, if phone calls are good, I think uh, emails can be helpful too because you can link to, you know, here's this house letter that just went in and I should put that in the chat here so you all have access, but you can say, you know, we're all calling on leadership. We just need you to help push or, you know, thank them if they were on it and say, you know, we appreciate your support. Um, but yeah, calls and emails at this point, no one's really taking meetings um, who's influencing the bill. It's too busy right now. So I wouldn't try to, I mean, I'm not saying don't schedule your Zooms, but now is kind of the time for, for calls and emails. I would just add that um, to the extent that you can reach out or have other influential members of your community, whether that's local elected officials or others, reach out, not just to your delegations, but also to the leadership of uh, on the Democratic side on the House and Senate, and also to Senator Wyden and uh, Congressman Neal, who are the chairs of uh, the tax committees. Uh, they have a disproportionate effect on the direction of this and um, to steer your delegations to message into, into them would be helpful as well. Yeah, that's a great I would just add, if we can get some of our partners in health care, education, uh, corporations, the faith community to be uh, echoing what we're asking for. So it's not just housers asking for housing, 
uh, that that at least you know works very well um, at local levels of government, and I think our congressional leaders would pay attention to that as well. And our associations are here to help, NHC, AHTCC, you need help doing this, you all have Facebook pages and tweet, tweet directly at your congressperson and say, I need you to do this and attach something. And so we can, you know, uh, all the associations are ready to help you with this because it's super important. Um, we are uh, at the end of time. And so I just want to underscore how um, huge this opportunity is for all of us. Uh, I want to thank uh, the panelists for coming today and for working with me to come up with a really good set of questions that uh, hopefully answered all of your questions. There were other questions in the chat and some technical questions that I'm not sure this panel can at, uh, answer. So we'll try to have Luke get back to you uh, directly uh, on that. And we put up a lot of resources, which Luke, I'm assuming NHC is going to uh, work on and just as a board member of NHC brazen plug like David did please join us uh, there has been no time like the present to create a national coalition around housing and as Steve and Buzz and Peter and Emily talked about housing is a continuum from uh, getting people off the street who are homeless to helping people buy a, their first home and we work on all of that here at NHC so we would encourage you to join us and, and thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us today we really appreciate it. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, again, this is Luke uh, Villalobos, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research at National Housing Conference. I um, want to echo Linda and say thank you to the panelists, uh, your insights and enormous intellectual capital on this issue and all the hard work that you've been putting into for a number of years on these issues. Uh, as you've all heard, we're, at, we're, in the, we're in the end zone. And so we got we to gotta get it across the finish line. Um, I have a couple of announcements. Um, as I said at the top of the hour um, or at the beginning of the webinar, we will um, be sending out uh, the recording of the webinar. Um, so feel free to share it amongst your networks. Um, we'll be sending out that recording to registrants uh, next week. Um, in addition, questions that we weren't able to get to, whether in the Q&A in the chat box, uh, we will be uh, answering questions as well after the webinar um, through email. And lastly, I'll just say, as, um, as Brittany has put into the chat box, we have another webinar coming up on September 22nd called It's Why It's Time to Unlock America's Single Family uh, Green Mortgage Market. Uh, you'll see the registration link there. Please feel free to register for that. And also we have uh, NHC has its annual policy symposium on October 13th. Um, and you'll see the registration link there as well. Um, this year we'll be focusing on technology and housing, the intersection there. So um, please register. And uh, I see David, I will let David have the last words. Thank you all and uh, welcome to Washington, Luke. Uh, he's uh, virtually on his way. We will, and not the virtual, the way we've come used to uh, uh, understanding it. He's actually gonna be flying here and moving to Washington. So we're Looking forward to having you here. And um, California's loss is NHC's gain. And uh, I will also note that uh, stay tuned for more on September 30th. Um, Sandra Thompson is going to be joining us for a comprehensive look at the future of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac with a host of experts and policymakers um, to talk about new directions uh, for the future, which I think we've all been uh, eagerly waiting for. So. With that, have a great day and thank you all for joining us and thank you to all our panelists for this and for all of your collaboration.